obviously, I know you have confidence in Frank Harrison would have started. Yeah. But that said, did he exceed expectations? You think? I don't know. But it's yeah. unbelievable what he was able to do. And you know, I know you had. Yeah. You know, you knew what kind of player he was and stuff. But what? The, yeah. You know, to start off the game, thirteen for thirteen, um, and then to have the next one uh, right on on, on spot. And, and we dropped a couple, to mm -hmm. be quite honest. Uh, I thought his accuracy was there. Uh, I thought his, his playmaking ability, I think he was smart uh, a lot of times in, in doing the things that we've trained him to do to get out of bounds, to slide, to take, to go get it when you have to go get it, but try to be minimal in absorbing those licks. Um, all of those things really uh, came to bear itself throughout the duration of the game. Uh, we had very, very high expectations from the moment we got here for Frank Harris, and it took a while to get here. Um, so I wouldn't say that we were surprised because we've had good defenses over the years, and whether it was in a spring or fall camp, uh, he's flashed that against our very talented defenses that we've had uh, on our campus. And so to see him do it against someone else was confirmation of something that we thought to be, uh, to be honest. And when you uh, you got here, got the job January 10th, or early January, yeah. and so he was in the winter of his uh, junior, junior year. And so can you talk about <coughs> his recruitment and when he committed to you? I forget yeah. when he committed to you and, and all. What, uh, yeah, so we, uh, you know, one of the first things you do, um, uh, we had already recruited here, uh, golly, defensive tackle uh, that we had at LSU. Uh, anyway, I had just recruited a defensive tackle from here, a Polynesian kid. He's got a lead, uh, Lafa Matufa. Okay. Uh, and so was uh, we were familiar with this area and had the, the cornerback, of course, a defensive back at Steel that at that time was committed in Baton Rouge. And so we had been in this area, uh, the young man who's at, at Texas now. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so we had been in this area quite a bit and was familiar. And so when I got here, went and followed up with all the area coaches that over the years we've had relationships with, and we asked those questions. Hey, man, talk to me about your guys. All right, who's the best player that you've seen in the city? Frank Harris. Uh, who's the best player that you've played against? Frank Harris. Who's the can't-miss guy? Frank Harris. And so it was consistent, and, and grassroots uh, are going to tell the truth. The, 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 the high school coach, the opponent, uh, and – you know, it was consistent throughout as we went around. So uh, needless to say, it was the first school, one of the first schools that we went to. And so our, recruited, our recruitment started on him immediately. And so uh, he was identified as a guy that, that we needed to pursue, uh, did so uh, in his senior year uh, at a home visit is when he committed to us. Um, and we were delighted, you know, at that time he was being recruited by Baylor, by Oregon, uh, Houston, you know, everybody who's, who was, was courting him. And uh, we felt very fortunate to be able to get him at that time. Um, yeah. Do you remember what about that? When, what, was it summer? You don't know? I'll, I'll yeah, check with yeah, yeah. you. Um, he, uh, he committed to you guys before he got injured, and then he got injured, and you guys kind of had to stick by him through that through that injury in high school. What was I guess what was that? Did you feel kind of? Yeah, you know, it was it was it was in the fall. Uh, Frank Selfo was at the game actually, yeah. and he called me. Eighteen Yeah, and he said uh, Frank Harris just went down. I was like, does it look bad? He's like, ah, oh, not really sure, but um, he's done for tonight. So we didn't know the severity of it. And uh, Daryl, his dad, called right after that to tell us they were bringing him to the hospital to be checked. Um, and so there were there there was never. Um, any reservation in our mind, should we get out of it, should we drop him, that uh, when we, even when we verbally, mutually, uh, the prospect in UTSA, when we commit to one another, we commit to one another. And we were committed to him that time, as well as the times that he's been on our campus, uh, to get him uh, up to par and, and readily available to be able to do what we thought he could do, and that is to move this football program forward. And Frank, and Frank, when you saw him, I mean, we started recruiting him. His junior year, he was amazing. You know, yeah. He had like over 2,000 yards, rushing over 2,000 yards, passing yeah. over 50 touchdowns. Yeah. Started watching film of that guy and you go, whoa. I mean, you've really recruited a lot of the guys. Yeah. And stuff. You kind of uh, jump out at you. And also, first time you lay eyes on him, and mm -hmm. what do you think of the kid? Yeah, you know, when he ran the ball, 
you know, we over the years we've recruited guys who were quarterback slash athletes, so you didn't quite know. And whether it was um, Eric Berry, whether it was Skylar Green, whether it was Spencer Ware, whether it was Tyron Matthews, you had all these guys who were quarterback athletes, and you didn't – Russell Shepard uh, from the city of Houston, and you just didn't know uh, exactly. But uh, after time, it continues to show itself that he had what it took, that he had a, a touch pass, that he had a deep ball – that he had accuracy, and we identified him from the get-go as a quarterback, a dual-threat quarterback that had the intangibles to play the position. And so we were very uh, intentional in, in recruiting him as our quarterback uh, from that time. But he, uh, he fit the bill of the Russell Shepherds of the world and those type of quarterbacks that had been so dominant within this state over the years that, could, uh, that was able to make a move to quarterback. To what extent were you able to script the offense Saturday or do anything else to try to make him comfortable playing for the first time in a while? Yeah, we it, it, it's our offense, so we didn't have to do anything different than what we already do. There weren't provisions made uh, to try to accommodate the game plan. And so, you know, our identity as we build this offense, have built this offense, uh, includes quarterback runs within it, um, includes tempo type stuff, includes huddle stuff. So it's, it's variations, but it's very much a, a spread offense that has uh, assaulting downhill runs that stretch and expand the defense east and west and north and south with opportunities to throw the ball deep as well. And so, How many rush attempts are you comfortable with him having in the game? Yeah, you know, very. Few, we didn't even have that many designed per se. A lot of them he tucked. Uh, from a scramble perspective, and so we haven't put a number on trying to identify how many times he will rush the ball. Coach, well, I know we'll move on to something else. Here. I, I, I want to ask a question as far as you've seen uh, on all years as a recruiter, you've seen so many athletes, so many mm -hmm. outstanding athletes and stuff, but uh, having said all that, uh, how do you describe a guy like Frank Harris? The other day, he, he has seems to, number one, he has a presence. You know, whenever he walks mm -hmm. in, even in a room, he's got a, dare I say, he's almost charismatic and stuff, but on the field, the way he slips away, it looks like, he's, it looks like people have him hemmed in, and it's, he just kind of slides, it's like he slides around in there and glides and stuff, and he get, comes out <laughs> and stuff. How do you describe, how do you describe that, that what, what he has, that ability, that escapability that he's got? Yeah, I, I think you hit it, on, hit, hit it on the point that he, he has escapability, he is elusive. Um, you know, the, the thing for us is to, to allow him to, to run the offense, all right, and the offense, uh, design as as it was for 11 different receivers to catch a pass, for multiple people to touch the ball, that uh, that he doesn't have to put the team on his shoulder and bear it all himself, that there's enough weapons around him uh, to spread the wealth. And so that would be ideal, um, that we wouldn't have to go Frank uh, run right, run left, up the middle Frank, uh, but to, to hand it off, to keep him honest. And then when they uh, – when they're not prepared to be able to squirt one out there for a big play. He can really throw too, right? Like yeah. you said the other day, in a, yeah. in a, a preseason, he said there's a yeah, he, essentially he, all these just a runner. But he, yeah, yeah he, uh, he has developed and continued to develop, to develop as a fine passer for us. Uh, we like his accuracy. We like his deep ball. Uh, we like that he, uh, he, he's a mentally uh, inclined young man who goes through progressions, get a great pre-snap reads and know – uh, where pre-snap, the, the idea of where the ball could be placed based on configuration of a secondary or a defensive front. And you mentioned that in the preseason that his weight, I mean, he was like 22 pounds. You, yeah. he's big, you just see he's bigger. Yeah, he, he's uh, much bigger. He's 170-something when we got him, and he's a little over 200 right now. Do you guys come away from this game healthy? <coughs> Kevin Davis and Trey Shannon look like they got banged up but came yeah. back in. Yeah, they're fine. Uh, typical bumps and bruises of, uh, of a football game, but uh, we're healthy. How are they feeling mentally? You mentioned it a little bit in the other room, but the, the confidence factor now, do you have to sort of guard against any yeah. complacency or overconfidence? Yeah, I, I think we, we, we put that game again in its rightful place as, as the first victory of a 2019 season uh, that have been enjoyed. Uh, but I promise you that that team in Waco is not sitting there uh, in awe that, uh, that we got work to do against a very, very quality football team. And uh, understanding uh, our way of life, our culture, and sticking to 
the basics of a, of a work week. And, and this week is a work week in preparation for a football game. And so we, we prepare accordingly uh, to go out and to play to the best of our ability. What jumps out at you? I know you were asked while on the other side, uh, Coach. What uh, what jumps out at you about those little banner bars, they call them? Yeah. Uh, you know, offensively, uh, they're about three deep in the backfield of all capable guys who have started at one point or another uh, with big playability that catch the ball out of the backfield, uh, a veteran quarterback, a two-year starter uh, who, who runs their offense very uh, efficiently. That is not a, a designated runner, but mobile enough to extend plays to run, to tuck it when he need to, uh, but yet a very uh, accurate passer as well. Guys on the perimeter uh, with big play ability uh, that has size, that have speed. There, there's three guys there that uh, played in the game against us last year and, and had catches and uh, played meaningful roles. Uh, a tight end uh, who's a 6'6 six, six guy who caught a couple of balls against us last year not to be slept on in a veteran offensive line headed by their center. Uh, from a defensive standpoint, uh, it'll be interesting to see. You know, they were a predominantly four-down team a year ago. Uh, they sprinkled some odd or three-down defense in. Uh, against Stephen F. Austin, they were they were that majority of. And so uh, we'll prepare for both accordingly to be able uh, to play against a veteran defense as well with backers that, uh, that run downhill in a hurry and uh, are not happy when they get to the ball carrier. They're a physical football team. And a back end that has uh, some track guys in there, you know, mm -hmm. some – Guys that can really run, that has length, that are six footers with good speed, that defend the deep ball well, and so um, we'll have to um, to be very uh, poignant in understanding how to attack this offense and defense accordingly, uh, and it's going to require uh, uh, our undivided attention in this week's of uh, week of preparation. How did the how, how did you think the offensive line played in week one? How did they play yeah. out? Uh, as a unit, I thought they were solid. Here's the thing. Um, when you look at it, I'd be much more concerned, J.J., if guys were just getting their butts whipped. What was happening is they, they played multiple fronts on us with movement and guys came clean. And so those are mental things that you can fix. All right, listen, don't stay on that too long. You got to come off. All right, if that guy's shaded this way, anticipate this. And so they're teachable things that we can grow from. If, if a guy was in front of us and, and, and sh uh, jammed us and shucked us to the side and we were just getting manhandled, I'd be concerned because that says you have a personnel issue of someone who could struggle with a, a defensive line uh, of a Big 12 opponent that is, that is bigger, that is, is faster, that is more dominant. And so we didn't, although we were not perfect, uh, there is an answer for it, and the answer for it is communication. The answer for it is identification and being on the same page. The offensive line, it really, if, if you have five guys there, uh, they're individual battles in a sense, but not because I have to go to the right guy that we work together as a unit. And this unit has to function well and identifying and communicating. And when people do something that they had not shown, uh, then there have to be an in-game adjustment. It was identified and at times wasn't always communicated. But I think uh, our guys are talented enough uh, to be able uh, to hold their own against this Baylor defense. We just have to do a better job in coaching them and having them ready to be prepared for the different nuances that could happen within the game. I feel like you had a pretty good one-two punch with McCormick and Brady in the backfield. Do you yeah. like how those two players complement each other? I do. Uh, you know, and you know, we played four backs, yeah. um, and and those two got the lion's share in this game uh, because of of how we needed to attack uh, this defense and the strength that they gave us. Uh, you will, you know, the running back position is one that uh, that uses multiple players. If you know anything about my history personally, we've always used, you know, two, three, four, five, and and had two, three, four NFL guys in one backfield at one time. And there's enough balls to go around to keep guys fresh, to keep guys dominant, to keep guys fast, to affect the outcome of the game. And that's our intention, to play multiple backs throughout the game. It's a good change of pace, those two guys, right, Brady? Yeah, and, and, uh, yeah. you know, they're, they're similar in style but yeah. yet different. Uh, both ball skilled, both has uh, have really good vision and feet. Um, 
And and I, I like what they do, you know, what they do. The other two that come in, I think they complement, meaning Devin Boston and uh, and B.J. Daniels. They're able to come in and give uh, a physicality, something that's assaulting, that's downhill, uh, that allows us to put a dent in the defense, if you will. And you like you got like McCormick in, in space. He's pretty good, right? Yeah, he knows what to do with it. Yes, yes, he does. Uh, what, uh, what about the defense? I know you gave the defense some props, uh, defensive line some props today. There, I know the strength of your defense, not the strength of your team. Now that you watch the film, can you maybe expand on that a little bit on how this graded? I mean, to me, that was the key. I mean, yeah. going in, I figured that their offensive line would not be able to handle your defensive yeah. line. That's kind of how it happened. And so the first unit goes in and, and they play our style of ball. Uh, they get off on, on on the snap. They penetrate, change the line of scrimmage. Um, and they wear on uh, on an offense, and then you bring the next platoon in, and uh, and then there's the standard, and the standard is the standard. It's not compromised. It's 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 guys understanding. This is the expectation, uh, and when a new unit come in, it isn't drop off or let's change what we do, or the expectation changes what we do. That the standard is the standard, and and we play up to it regardless of who's in the game. And at that position group, more than any, we just have more quantity to be able to do it. And so there wasn't drop off. You know, if if it was Brandon Madison, if it was Jalen Gelm, uh, Jalen Haynes, if it was King Newton, if it was Balen Baker, if it was Eric Banks, or Simon Wise, Lorenzo Danzler, You know, they 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 all Clarence Hicks. It just continued. Eric Banks, Jer- Jared Macklin. We just continue to roll those guys in, and we're very fortunate to be in that position because it allows the back end guys to play with confidence. So they they complement each other because of the rush you're getting. It it highlights uh, the strengths of those guys at the back end because they don't have to cover forever. Yeah. All right, and and it's something that we sh- certainly needed to improve on because we were not affecting the quarterback enough a year ago, and I think now we we are or at least in one week we have, again, uh, resembled that of, of a de- decent team uh, with potential to be a really good football team. But we're not there yet, but um, hopefully we can get there as we continue to hammer away week after week. Coach, what role did the tight ends play in your offensive game plan? A big one. <laughs> a big one. Uh, you know, we're still uh, bringing Halen Stewart along. Uh, he, he probably could have played um, – was injured uh, over a year ago, two years ago, and, and the rehabilitation that was needed to get him where he need be uh, did not come to the forefront. And so when I speak of our sports medicine de- department and where they have taken us, we've isolated guys like Halen who had continued uh, multiple injuries um, and never had gotten back and appeared as though he's injured again, he's injured again. The reality is we had never got him back to where he needed to be uh, and we're there now. And so with him not in a game, it leans us more to playing in a two tight end set at times, 12 personnel. Um, and, and those guys have been spectacular to, uh, for us in both the run game and pass games. I think they give us the balance that you want to be able to, to keep both attached, to detach them or get them off the ball, detach them in space, to run with those formations and sets as well as pass out of those formations and sets. And so that's, that's, that's a big uh, bonus for an offense to put that type of stress on the defense with the multiplicity of the tight end position of guys that are effective in both the pass and run game. We saw two touchdowns from that position. I don't know if they had that from that group last year. Is it just the talent yeah. you have there? Or are you guys yeah, we, we didn't have two touchdowns in the game last year. <laughs> 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 All right, maybe once. Or twice. <laughs> right. mm. uh, Isn't that the great thing about football? <laughs> I was going to say, you only, play, you, only play one, you only play one game a week. Like, that's why we don't have time to practice. Yeah. I talked to Mitch about that. You yeah. always complain about it. We don't get to practice. Yeah. You play a game every, every other day. Now, it's this true. one, you can, you can see what you did, then you flush it, then you go and get ready for the next one. Yeah, you can. Uh, it, I think uh, it's just some of the things that we want to do out of that personnel grouping. Uh, we like that unit. We like our tight end room. We think uh, they're a bonus to our football team. We've upgraded in that room. Um, with the addition of Leroy and Carlos, uh, along with a young Oscar, uh, to complement Gavin Sharp, who's the only returner that we have there. So we've added three additions to the tight end room 
that have been tremendous uh, uh, compliments to our football team. Um, you think Oscar will play at all this year? Or are you gonna think about uh, redshirting? Oh, uh, he played yesterday. Oh, did he get another play? Yeah, time? yeah, okay. he got in in the last. I didn't notice because the field usually moves when he goes on the field. He's a big old guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, he kind of blends in now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he played. Uh, you know, we're. we're uh, the NC2A have, have been considerate enough to to allow these guys to these young guys um, to relieve some veteran guys at times when need be. So with the new four game, um, yeah, yeah. able to participate play uh, allows us to to put them in at times and not necessarily burn their red shirt. So, yeah, so yeah. uh, he'll he, he will probably play if we can get him in as much as possible, but no determination have been made exactly for it because it's such a long season. Yeah. Who will redshirt or not? You know, some guys don't trigger until week three or four, and then they play the last uh, eight games uh, of the season, which is still a long season. So we'll, we'll we'll take it week by week, but like the progress that Oscar's making. People always say that tight end group can be a safety valve for a quarterback. When you have a young quarterback like Frank Harris, is that an asset for him? I think so. Uh, even whether it's the tight end or, or the back, uh, they're the check down. The, the last progression in it, and, and we threw 10 to the backs when they were blitzing us from the boundary and doing those things because that was his check down. Uh, and not necessarily the primary receiver, but just what the uh, defense was giving us. And any time a quarterback is doing that, you look at those quarterbacks or those teams that have success, they throw it to the tight end, they throw it to the back because the quarterback then recognizes not to eat it and not to, to waste it or even throw it away, that there is a spot for you to go in the midst of boom, 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 ah, give it to him, whether it's the tight end or the back. And so, uh, yes, they are uh, a quarterback's best friend. Frank looked a lot more comfortable going deep into his reads than you might expect from a young quarterback. Did that show on film as well? Yeah, I think he said it best. He's got a lot of practice. Yeah, after two years, not really young. He's an old man. Yeah, he's, he's got a lot of practice at it. Uh, and just, you know, he's, he's a sponge. He wants to know. He wants to be coach. He's extremely humble. Uh, we have veteran guys around him like Brandon Garza uh, and Cordell Grundy, good young men who say to him, um, you got the lead, all right, let's go, let's go move it. As a, as a quarterback unit, it, that's the beautiful, when I talk about player-led and buy-in and team, there, he, here's a, a guy who, who's younger on the field and then younger than both of those guys in Cordell and Brandon Garza, who, who vied for the position, who would love to be the starter, and yet they're right there with him, helping him prepare for the game. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about uh, this sport, the greatest sport in all, of all, uh, that it requires so many men to be on the same page for one common goal. And we're doing that right now, and it's allowing us to uh, to be better uh, as a whole. Did you address the uh, penalties with your team when you met yesterday? What was how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it went well. You know, uh, games are hard to come by. Touchdowns you work extremely hard for, and uh, the first one, uh, the first one was on me because here's what you teach a team: uh, when someone scores. Um, Carlos didn't score. We scored. We scored on that play, and we're gonna we're gonna rejoice and we're gonna enjoy it with one another. All right, we're gonna be jubilant. You go meet your teammate. You chest bump him. You high five. You do whatever you have. All right, and I'll take the first one. All right, and so I want us to be excited about playing the game. I don't want uh, a big play to happen and we just kind of look. You know, this game is is a game full of emotion that teams, um, you talk about momentum swings and things of that nature, and, and you start feeling it, you start smelling it, it, it's in the air, let's go, let's go, let's go, and guys begin to corral. Now what has to happen is you have to control that. That, uh, you know, to, to get in a situation where you're scoring multiple touchdowns um, is, is a good thing, uh, and hopefully it gets to the point where it becomes routine all right, that we're mature enough to recognize we score a touchdown that's a norm and let's let's enjoy it. Oh my God, we scored, you know, but it's that's part of a, a team that's growing. Um, you know, I can live with the uh, the procedure every now and then, uh, a holding that happens within the game. The excessive celebration things are what we're not going to tolerate.
we're not going to do that. That's not who we are. That's not, that's not our program. That's not our culture. That's not the, the discipline structure program that we run. And so those were the ones that, uh, that were most concerning. Celebration. Think, Excessive yeah. celebration. Um, there, it's, it's almost cliche, Frank, but you tell me, they, they always say, you hear the TV guys say, it's all, the, the good teams make the most improvement from game one to game two. Is that, yeah. is that overdone, or do you think that's, yeah. that's uh, just a natural thing there that what teams are going to? Yeah, I think it's week after week after yeah. week. You'd like to, I don't know if that's the greatest jump from one to two. Right. Um, but you, you like to improve every week. Um, I guess that if you win two, you say you lost the first one, the second, you say the biggest jump is week three because you want to believe that. <laughs> so I think every week uh, that you, you try to build upon, you, you recognize the things that you did well uh, and try to improve on it. You recognize the things that you did not do well. Uh, you acknowledge it. You own it. Uh, you put them in those same positions and reenact it that it doesn't happen again. How do we coach against it? How do we build on it? And instead of saying, don't do this, we say to them, this is how you do this. And it's positive reinforcement of a behavior that's desired opposed to reprimandment of not to do, but show them this is how to do it. You mentioned about football, the greatest sport and everything, but do you think that's why it is, Frank, from the standpoint it's almost the ultimate team sport because yeah. there's so many people on the field. And yeah, it's kind of, there's, there's yeah. So yeah. you know, so many other sports, you, they're individual sports uh, as a tennis player, as a track athlete. Uh, even basketball that has team in it is five people, but I can really uh, take over. You know, if I'm the point guard, I have the ball. I'm, I can take over and do it by myself in a sense, to an extent. Um, it's not that way in, in football. It's not that way, that what you do affects the guy next to you, affects the guy behind you. Uh, defensively, that this, this, the fit of this play fits like a glove, like a puzzle, that you're in the A gap, he's in the B, he's in the C, he's in the D. He spills this, he comes over top, he's a late alley player. All of that has to happen. And the best teams do that best because they understand they function as a unit and that um, to make the play don't necessarily means to make the tackle. That it's my containment that turned it back inside so that my buddy can make the play. And so it's it's the most unselfish sport that you, you ask of. And so these offensive linemen who gets no name recognition, who we don't talk about this only morning. Holding, right? Only they're holding, right? Yeah, we, we don't talk about all morning. Uh, it's those guys that ran into that that end zone in a celebratory way, uh, and it is a beautiful thing that needs to be corralled and, and will be. Um, as you know, you, you guys have been around us long enough. That's not who we are. I think there's a lot of excitement. There was a lot of talking that went into that game, and uh, we'll, we'll do better in, in handling that. Frank, the Roadrunners are, are huge underdogs headed to, to Baylor. What, yeah. what does UTSA have to do to – you know, for an upset one. Yeah, well, we, uh, we got to get through this film and, and, and see those things. We haven't started game planning specifically yet. We're still studying them. Of course, there was off-season view of it, but now that they have one game under their belt against Stephen F. Austin, even then uh, you've seen a dramatic change in some of the things they're doing, as I alluded to from a defensive front standpoint. So we'll continue to study this team and find out those things that will be necessary to secure victory. Uh, but I know this, uh, this game as complex as it can appear is a very simple football game. The team that tackles well, the team that blocks well, the team that takes care of the football, uh, usually going to be the team that have an opportunity to win this game. And so to put our kids in position to block the right guys on certain plays, to tackle well uh, because they're in the right spot, and to take care of the football are the fundamental principles that will determine the success of the game. Now, everything else is schematic, uh, but blocking, tackling, and taking care of the football are fundamental principles that uh, will play out in this game. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks Frank. Frank.